everyone. Welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, Creative Career Paths, Hair and Makeup. I am Lida Truick with LA County Library and I'll be your host today. Creative Career Paths is a series exploring careers in the entertainment, film, TV, and media industries. In today's program, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with makeup artists uh, Eva Loza and Alan Noble. Uh, Alex. Alex Noble, why did I have that? Sorry. Um, That's okay. And hair designer for Shauna Mosley. First up, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Browning, who's going to be facilitating our conversation today. Kimberly is a filmmaker based in LA and is the founder and festival director of Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1998. She's an associate short film programmer at Tribeca Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She's been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team, developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. Next up, we have Eva Loza. She's a veteran makeup artist for film and television with work spanning a broad spectrum of film and TV. Her extensive work collaborating with top directors and cast has brought a wide range of looks and characters to life. Her credits include Dave Franco's upcoming feature, Somebody I Used to Know, Eli Roth's Cabin Fever, as well as television hit shows, The Librarians, Aha, Twin Peaks, Portlandia, and Leverage. Um, makeup artist Alex Noble has a keen eye and a talent for realistic makeup effects coupled with his experience with lighting and camera work and always achieves the look directors want quickly and efficiently. He values a communicative, harmonious, and cohesive set and is quick to establish a good rapport with crew and talent. Alex credits include Army of the Dead, Space Jam 2, Captain Marvel, Orville, and Fear the Walking Dead. Last but not least, we have Hoshana Nicole Mosley. She's been a hair designer uh, almost 10 years, working on a variety of film and television shows, such as Girls Trip, Barbershop, The Next Cut, Criminal Minds, and All American, as well as photo shoots and music, music videos with artists such as Icona Pop, Seven Streeter featuring Chris Brown. So with this heavy hitting crew, I will now pass it off to you, Kimberly. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us. We hope that um, something in here today inspires you and helps give you um, some ideas about next steps that you can do to further your career, start your career, nurture your career in um, one of the most important departments um, that makes a film or a television show come to life. So we want to connect the dots on, um, we all come from so many different backgrounds and we wanna demystify what people think. It's such an intimidating world and many people live within miles of the studios and don't think that there's a pathway or a door that can be open to them. Uh, and I think we're all here to share our stories, to help connect people that you can come from any background, um, as long as you work hard and you really facilitate your talent. I don't care if you've been in the foster care system. I don't care the, the things that you've been through in your life make you a more well-rounded and, um, and deeper designer and artist that we wanna collaborate with. So today is in the spirit of telling you where we come from and what we've been through so you can connect the dot that uh, no matter where you come from, that there's a great warm family here and a really robust career that um, you can have and tell your parents that it's um, not a huge big risk. There's actually really great careers along a wide range of departments. And there's a lot of behind the scenes um, work that a lot of people don't hear about when you see somebody win an Oscar for acting, or you see all the articles about the big directors, there's an entire beehive of people and jobs that you might not hear of, but might be right for you. And so that's what we're gonna be um, exploring today. Uh, all right, so we wanna start with, I like to, kind of identify what was that moment where something that you're passionate about, something you thought you were a hobby, you had that kind of moment where you realized this could be our life, this could be our career. And I think, especially in hair and makeup growing up, um, that's something that a lot of us deal with on a daily basis. We watch our parents navigate 
your hair and makeup. And so the connectivity that this is a career uh, might be a little elusive for some. So can you guys each talk about if you can remember when was the first connection for you that, oh, there's this whole world here. And I didn't know this was, this was a job that one could have. And, and if you have any uh, thoughts about opportunity that was open up for you or how you created your own, we'd love to hear. So um, Porshana, if we'd love to start with you and just tell us a little bit about where you're from and how this opened up, this world opened up for you. I am from actually um, South Central LA, born and raised. And um, I always, of course, like most girls in South Central growing up, just doing their cousin's hair, their aunt's hair, their mom's hair. And for me, I actually asked my parents right before I graduated high school if I could go to cosmetology school. And of course, for them, their experience with hairstylists is mostly just booth rental. So they shot the idea down. Um, they told me I had to go to college. I had to get a degree. Like hair was not an option for them, for me. So I went to college and I was the girl in the dorm studying and doing all of the girls in the dorms. I was doing all their hair. And finally, at that point, I said, you know, I need to live for me. I left school and actually came back to Los Angeles and I went to cosmetology school and we did a photo shoot with our graduating class. And that moment I was just like, wait, this is really what I want to do. Like I want to get into photo shoots and music videos and um, just networking so much. And it actually paid off for me, just always like being kind, um, knowing my stuff, always being a, not a teacher, but like a student, always learning because this industry is forever changing, forever growing. And just being a sponge is what's like really helped me in my career. I love it. I love that. I think we, a lot of us can relate to that. And a lot of the young people in our panel, we, we have a 12 year old who's in the sixth grade who already thinks she wants to do hair. We have a 15 year old who wants to work with um, celebrities, hair and makeup. And so you're speaking right to the core of what our audience is, is thinking about. Super relatable. Mm -hmm. Eva. Mm. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eva Loza and I mostly grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Bellingham, Washington. Um, and I think I'm going to date myself here, but it was an episode of Reading Rainbow with LeVar Burton, who he had special effects makeup come do his makeup. And I, I don't know if it was Michael Westmore from Next Generation. I think I might be Doing makeup on Lavar, and I was. So Eva, you um froze a little bit, so I'm gonna have you say oh, that. There we are. Okay. Where was I? Just um that you uh probably Michael Westmore probably was the person that Lavar had on, maybe. Maybe I might have my ears crossed. Yeah. Uh, that sounds about it, right, though. It probably would have been Michael. Yeah. It it pro Michael. Yeah, probably would have been. Anyway, um. Uh, I was very inspired. My, you know, my cousin gave me a bunch of her old makeup. So I was doing makeovers on my, my childhood friends. And then I got into high school and discovered theater and was, uh, ran the makeup department. Um, and then I went to community theater, uh, in, in Bellingham and then, I found, and then of course my parents also were like, you have to get a degree, you have to go to college. And I found uh, a makeup school and I went, no, I don't. And I went to makeup school and uh, been a professional since I was 19. And it's- uh, And so from makeup school, mm -hmm. what was your first uh, connection that film and television was an option? Oh, I made that connection way before I went to makeup school. Okay. So it what was, was your first step out of makeup school to create opportunity for yourself? 
remember. Um, Particularly because you're in a smaller town, you're in a smaller area. Oh, well, I went to makeup school. I went to makeup school in LA. Okay. There you go. I'm, I no, I saw the writing on the wall and I was like, well, gotta go. So I, I went to LA and kind of never looked back. Right. And from there, school like gave me resources and it was just about nose to the grindstone. I mean, I remember applying for my first job, sending a paper resume through the mail. So is that, <laughs> we've come a long way. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Alex, yeah. you have an incredible journey and to the career that you've done so much. And I love the journey you've been on. So can you share a little with our audience as to how you started? Uh, sure. Um, I was 16 years old on the set of a Pepsi commercial. Um, and they had the alien from Alien 3, which is arguably my favorite cre movie creature of all time. And um, so watching the transformation of Alec Gill, uh, sorry, Tom Woodruff Jr., who was just, you know, a dude in a, a unitard, basically, um, sitting in a chair, putting on this alien bodysuit. Again, still a dude sitting in a chair, putting on the gloves. Still a dude sitting in a chair, putting on the feet. Still a dude sitting in the chair. And then they put the helmet on the head, and he no longer was Tom. He was the alien. And at 16 years old, I knew it was a dude in a suit, but it was still like being very careful walking around him. Like, you know, it's the alien, but I know it's not. And it was just that whole moment of, um, you know, holy crap, this dude has transformed into the alien before my very eyes. And it fascinated me, you know, and my dad was, my dad is a photographer and, you know, was um, very, very busy, did Virginia Slims, Parliament Chesterfield, you know, all the, all the campaigns people don't want to talk about now. But it, it exposed me very early on to the makeup, you know, makeup and, and, and hair and television and film and excuse me and um it was just something that that at, at that moment i knew that that was something that i wanted to do and um but i also knew that i didn't have the creative mind to make them like i i, I can't sculpt an alien like i just i mean i can but it's not like you know that's not my passion and so um my first actually paid makeup gig was working at a haunted house called the uss nightmare in cincinnati ohio and so that was how I got my start doing makeup was, well, I mean, I studied uh, theatrical makeup, but my first paid makeup job was a haunted house. And it was funny because um, in, I studied theatrical makeup at the University of Cincinnati and learned very early on that I hate theater makeup. Um, I enjoy theater. I just hate the makeup. <laughs> I, it's just, it's too much for me. I don't like, you know, it's like, you know, just, I mean, smearing it on and you know, very defined lines and just it was like too much. It was too much. And so I, in fact, it was funny because um, Lena, my teacher, was always grading my test saying, do more, do more, do more. And I was just like, hmm. And it was funny because I, I, I don't know where the test is now, but on one of my tests, uh, she wrote, you will never make it as a makeup artist, right? <laughs> and she was Russian. She was Russian. And it really motivated me to like, you know, basically do the makeup that I love, not the makeup that she wanted me to do. And so when I became a regular on Desperate Housewives, I sent her my name, I sent her a picture of the call sheet with my name under the makeup department. I said, never going to make it, huh? And she sent back a congratulations. I'm very proud of you. But that was the way Lena motivated you was she got you angry enough that you wanted to prove her wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, you know, it, it, it was definitely a very a very good way of motivating me because you know when when I get pissed off it's like I want to either fix it or prove you wrong and so that's what it did but to 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 bring the whole thing full circle in 2016 I was the department head on a movie called Little Evil and we shot that in Cleveland and Akron and so I was able to go back home home and work you know in my old stomping grounds where I graduated high school and then I drove down to Cincinnati and I went to the USS Nightmare because we were shooting uh, September, October, November. And the, the nightmare was open. And it was funny because I went through it. And um, 
uh, uh, Alan Rizzo, the owner of B&B Riverboats, he saw me and he goes, Alex? Now keep in mind, I hadn't been back to Cincinnati in like 18 years. So he's like, Alex, is that you? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, what are you doing here? And I told him and, and I, I said, I'm like, I'm so glad that you're here because I just wanted an opportunity to say thank you because you were my first paid makeup job. And this is what led me to be where I am today. You know, and so because to me, to me, thanking people for what they've done for my life is more important than anything else. You know, yeah. when I work with actors that I admire, I really don't care about getting pictures with them. What I care about is being able to look them in the eye, shake their hand and say, thank you for affecting my life. Yeah, I love you know? that. And thanks for sharing that. I think it's a great place because I really wanted to talk about uh, the thing that makes our job work is for those who get into film and television, there's another layer of creative collaboration that we need to talk about and talk about how you found the mentors or, or was able to teach yourself that extra layer of your relationship with the actor. And then we're gonna talk about your relationship with the director. And so the hair and makeup department and all of the people in the team is, as a filmmaker, my partner in getting my actor ready to come to set and be who I need them to be. Um, and I think the difference between a career in salon and a career even in some of the other verticals being weddings, event makeup, is that you have to understand and learn how an actor works so you can be part of their process to get them ready to set as opposed to being uh, uh, all the conversation isn't necessarily social and kind right. of, I want to talk about what that light bulb moment was for you to realize you, you, you have to also be really sensitive and in tune to how the actor works and how you learned that. A lot of us learned it by doing it wrong. <laughs> the first time. That's the only way you learn. Yeah. You don't learn anything or an actor's by doing like, things right. You have right. to stop talking to me. I'm trying to get ready to be a serial killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for, for Shauna, can you talk? And for Shauna, you also deal with um, uh, a lot of music celebrities. You do a lot of music video and commercial work and beauty mm -hmm. uh, for for agency and uh, fashion. And so that's also a really specific type of artist that you're collabing with. So talk a little bit about when you realize it's talk more a bit than what you learned at Salon, what you learned at cosmetology school in terms of artistic collaboration and being a good partner? So the first thing you have to understand is what you want to do half of the time is not what the director or the actor has in mind. And nine times out of 10, everybody's on a different page when it comes to the look. Um, sometimes the directors, the producers and the writers, they want a certain look the actor wants a certain look and you as an artist, you're like, oh, I came up with this look based off of makeup, hair and costumes. We all collaborated together and it's nothing what the actor wants. Um, and time also factors into the difference between like being on a music video versus being on a film set or a TV set or just being in a salon. Like in a salon, you could take three hours to do whatever you need to do, highlights, cut, color, a style versus film and TV, you have 45 minutes or less. Um, music video, sometimes they give you like an hour to two hours depending on the artist. So you have to fine tune your skills and to know some artists, they're okay with you taking 45 minutes to an hour to do a style versus some artists, they don't want to sit in your chair for 45 minutes. They only want to sit in your chair for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and they or at all. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and you can schedule that time. You can schedule that 45 minutes. But it's fine. They're going to show up late because they only want to sit in your chair for 15 minutes. So you have to know, you also don't have to know when to be quiet. Like if they come in and they're reading their lines, you have to just read the room and you have to know your actor. I know there was a time um, I had music playing and I was having a conversation and my actress, she's like, 
I have to, the scene is very emotional. I need to be bawling my eyes out. Like, can we please turn off the happy music and stop talking? <laughs> so there, you just have to read the room. You have to make sure you have really great time management and hairstyling wise, you have to make sure those styles last, especially for like photo shoots and music videos. They can be hanging upside the wall. And if you have a ponytail, you have to make sure that ponytail lasts or even doing, um, I did a tour and the dancers, they can be flipping, doing all types of stunts and it has to stay and it has to look good within 15 minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Eva, as you share with us your thoughts, um, you know, when you were reading a script, I think it's really important that you have to be tuned into the script and where we are in the script and what kind of collaboration you do ahead of time before the shoot with the actor to come up with what is what are these styles, what is his makeup that's sharing with the audience on screen, all this information I need the audience to know. You know, how do you approach that conversation? Does the actor come to you? Do you come with samples or drawings? Tell us a little bit about how you navigate that collaboration. Well, I would say, first of all, you have those initial conversations with the director because half the time the director didn't write the script. And so the director might have different ideas as to what's on the script. So you're taking the script at face value and then you do your breakdown and you, and you, design basically what's happening with your character that you're responsible for. And then you go to the director and say, Hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking, thoughts, feelings. And then, then you collaborate with the director. Um, you come to an equilibrium there and understanding you listen to your director, first of all, for sure, go back to the drawing board, redesign, and then you get to meet your actor. Um, and then you, you know, you have a kind of a bare knuckle conversation about, about product. A, a lot of actors right now are really concerned about them being the products being cruelty free and vegan. And, you know, um, you have to really understand your products too. Um, your adhesives, Alex, I'm sure you can appreciate the fact that sometimes actors are like, ah, what? what's what's in that solvent and they kind of get freaky about silicones and anyway um acetone remind me to talk about the acetone uh, right totally um uh and you you hammer it out with your actor be like we're hitting this beat here and then on this beat you're gonna get beat up or whatever and this is what i'm thinking here and oftentimes the actors will most of the time in my experience are pretty game they're pretty game for going for it um, and uh, are sometimes concerned about how long it's gonna take, but oftentimes are fully understanding that they're taking on a character that might require some extra time and effort. And they're usually, you know, concerned about a couple of things, but you're like, hey, I've got this trick and we're gonna do it quickly over here and whatever. Um, you know, you kind of come to an understanding uh, in that respect. Does that answer your question? It does. It really does help a lot. Um, right. And Alex, talk about the acetone. But I also <laughs> um, want, you know, you all uh, have such great reputations with dealing with what I want to say sometimes is called a difficult actor or an actor who maybe has a different set of rules, right? And they can be really, really difficult and you each have navigated this, this situation. Um, Rita Wilson. And are known to be really great at that and part of productions, putting together a great team. If I know I've got a really specific actor in my crew, Alex and Eva, and now Portiana, I'm gonna add you to this, are always my first call because you guys have demonstrated over the decades that you really understand how to navigate some more difficult personalities. So Alex, I would love to have you integrate as well some of the things that you learned in your training or how was it your personality? Is it something in you and your characteristic 
that you've developed over the years to be part of that actor's process and helping them be happy or calming them down. Or, I mean, we've worked with people, Eva, that wouldn't let anybody touch them, very famous people. And within half an hour, Eva's got them, they're laughing and joking and collaborating mm -hmm. and being able to turn that dynamic. I think as, a, as people are deciding, is this a career for me? things that you have to know about yourself to grow and learn. And Alex, if you could add that in, to, it would be great to get your perspective on that. Absolutely. Can I actually, can I actually address the, uh, the thing that Mylene said in chat real quick? Sure. So absolutely. you're saying that your dream is to be able to have the opportunity to work on celebrities' hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. If that is your dream, it's not going to happen. Thank if you. If your dream is to be a hair and makeup artist, then it will happen. But if yeah. your dream is to work on celebrities, it won't happen because we can smell that stuff a mile away. And when mm -hmm. somebody is just interested in working on celebrities, we don't want them around because what's going to happen is they're going to spend the entire time trying to butter up to the celebrity, getting their phone numbers, chatting and not doing the job that needs to be done. So if your goal is to be a hair and makeup artist, then do that. Be a hair and makeup artist. But if you want to be a celebrity hair and makeup artist, it's... I mean, you're better off just being a makeup artist and letting the celebrities hire you as opposed to you seeking them out. Right. That's really helpful uh, perspective in how um, to present yourself as you come through your training and start your first opportunities. Thank you so much for that advice, Alex. I'm sure that Mylene really appreciates it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it, you know, I, I know what she's saying. Like, she would love the opportunity to work with celebrities, the issue is, is when your goal is to work with the celebrities, then that takes the precedent over wanting to do a good job. Sure, so I think it's a psychological way to thing. Present it as as we each, you know, a huge part of our work is getting jobs, right? A huge yeah. part of yep. our work is a freelance lifestyle. So yep. for Mylene, it might be great advice in just how she's presenting it, because it might be more. I want to work on the top television shows. I want to work on. Um, great projects because that yeah. goes hand in hand with the, the level of, of talent, the best talent. And I think if it's a, a matter of how she's presenting and how she's sharing it, you want to have to work on the best shows. You want to work on right. the best music and the best, yeah, commercials or models. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story about Desperate Housewives with me because it, it, it also boils down into my personality and what you were saying about dealing with difficult people. And I know I know I know I let a name slip earlier, and anybody who knows that person I'm knows gonna that edit I'm that right. out. <laughs> it's okay. And this um, is gonna live forever on YouTube. So that's fine. Oh, right. He knows it too. Um, but uh, I so I used to be a bouncer. And part of being a bouncer is you mean like at a conflict. bar? Oh yeah, nightclub, okay. gothic industrial too in Cincinnati. So yeah, that was that was an interesting time. Honestly, one of my favorite times. But conflict resolution and de-escalation was one of our major things, right? Well, what has more conflict than a film set? So that coupled with two years of psychology in, 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 in college, um, and originally being from Brooklyn, New York, I definitely have that personality where it's like, I'm blunt, but people love me for it. And I can tell somebody no, and they still want to buy me a drink um, at times, most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't go that route, but you know. But for me, what I do is I gauge the actor based on their personality, their behavior. Uh, like who was it that worked on Portlandia? Was it you, Porshana? No. Oh, it was you, okay. So do you remember Ellen Bloodworth? I, I need to be clear. I was not full time on that show, but right, I dipped right. yeah. in and out of that show often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you remember the older woman, uh, Ellen Bloodworth? She like uh, late sixties, maybe early seventies, gray hair. I don't know how. I never watched the show, so I don't. I don't know how involved she was, but I know she was on it. Okay. So anyway, so anyway, so she uh, she was on a movie that we were doing, and. Um, she is a very New York East Coast vibe. So it was kind of like, you know, is she standoffish or is she just quiet? And so I ended up being the one to do her makeup, right? And so she comes in and she sits down and she looks at my airbrush setup and she goes, that's a very complicated bong you've got there. And I was like, well, play your cards right. I'll show you how to use it later, 
right? So attitude with attitude, right? And then later on, um, we were on set and she goes, uh, she goes, honey, do you mind holding my soup while I do my scene? I'm like, sure, no problem. So I'm holding her chicken noodle soup and she comes back, right? And she looks down at it and she goes, there were more noodles in it when I left it with you. And I looked at her and I said, I said, well, it's either Alzheimer's or your eyesight. Either way, I'd get it checked out. And she just looked at me and goes, we're going to be friends. <laughs> sure. So for me, it's like, you know, um, working with Tom Sizemore, another one, you know, when Ooh, you, I when they, that. oh yeah. Uh, and you know, when, when they, when they smack you verbally, if you don't smack them back, then they walk all over you because oftentimes they want somebody that is going to banter with them. You know, um, they want somebody who's going to verbally spar with them. So, so Alex, are you some... saying it's more as you are self-identifying what characteristics you have to navigate that? Are you saying that it's having the understanding of figuring out who's which type of person? Quickly? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I do suffer from ADD, so I'll go off on a tangent and not realize it. Yeah. So, um, Eva? Yeah, no, if I may, if I may add to that, it's, it's, it's best described as really having great soft skills. Like you really have to know when you can banter for banter or shut your mouth. Absolutely. And be quiet, be little, be available for them in their moment of need, but don't interfere. Um, you also don't want to get yourself fired. You don't want to get yourself fired because sometimes, uh, sometimes that tit for tat isn't always welcome. It's it's right. a really hard skill to learn. Um, I think it's telling that Alex said he went to psycho like psychology, took some psychology classes, um, and uh, I think Rashonda really understands as well. Um, that um, as a hairstylist, you're part therapist. People talk oh, yeah. and talk about things that's happening and tell you really personal stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'm yeah. just, it's- That's really helpful. It's yeah. really the soft skill. It's understanding, yeah, understanding those Great difficult personalities it. and knowing, knowing yeah. what, what the, occasion calls for like sure. i would have said if some actress was like there were noodles there i would have said and they were delicious like i you know like that's <laughs> it, but i think you know, what you guys are both describing is the different ways that you set out to build rapport is yeah. actually yeah. it's organic but it's also part of your job which is i think what yeah. i'm trying to drill down to and and just uh, sorry can i just clarify real quick so Yes, I would not have said that to anybody, but Ellen, the way she approached me, right. I knew that she had that, able you know, to she had that her. very biting, yeah, that very biting wit about that, her. That was going to work for her, yeah. Exactly, but I, I mean, like, it. for instance, with uh, with Eva on Desperate Housewives, I didn't do her makeup, but I was on the show because of her um, and her makeup artist, um, Gina, uh, Gina Rylander. Um, with Eva, I could joke with her, but I never... I never was uh, uh, acerbic with her. I never was acidic with her. You know, I never had any... You can read that that was where her vibration was. So yes, exactly. That's super for, me, for her, for her, it was childish humor. Like, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I would make child jokes with her, Bye. and that would make her laugh. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, like Tom Sizemore, as you know, you know, you can pretty much punch him in the face and he'll laugh. Right. You know, like, there's, there's, there's no so limit with Tom. Yeah, that's super helpful. So as we talk about, um, as people kind of are self-searching and doing their own education and finding ways to get as, as, as much experience and seeking out knowledge as they navigate launching their creative career in this space, um, one of the things about the hair and makeup departments is that you have a, uh, also a responsibility for health. And, and especially in these times okay. that's taken your departments to this whole other level. So Prashana, I'm going to start with you, but what do people need to know about um, how it works for hair and makeup and getting qualified 
by the state or the city? And then what additional qualifications do you need to actually be able to be qualified? Is film and television require you have a certain sort of beauty license? Prashana, can you start with hair and then I'll circle back to you guys. I just want real quick facts about kind of what the law is and what the pra best practices are and the expectations when you get to a film and TV for your first job, what they expect you to know. Portia, so, yeah, absolutely. You have to be licensed to be a part of Local 706 in order to do hair. You have to- We're gonna start really quick. So the Local 706 is the union that covers yeah. the hair and makeup department. We're gonna put up a link for you guys to go check out their website and the training. And there's some great resources you guys should get familiar with. Go ahead, Prashana. Yes. So you have to be licensed in the state of California in order to be a part of Local 706. And that's the bare minimum. But from there, you need to know, I would say you need to, once you graduate cosmetology school, you know nothing. You only know how to pass. <laughs> So let me go back and ask a few more details for those that are just starting out. Yeah. Um, is it the same qualification that you would do to be able to work in a salon? Is it the same training everybody kind of goes through when you say getting qualified or getting a license? That license is issued by the state and that the exact same license you would get if you want to work in a beauty place or do weddings. Is it all the same training? It, you have to have a cosmetology license. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. That's helpful. And so yeah. when people are looking online and they want to look up for some of the trainings, that's what they're looking for. They want to yeah. be able to be in a training program mm -hmm. that's going to help prepare them to take the California cosmetology. cosmetology it's called? Yeah, it's called Cosmetology State Board. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Super mm -hmm. helpful. Now, I know the hours have changed. When I had to get my license, I had to get 1,600 hours, but I believe recently the hours have been decreased due to COVID. So I'm not too sure what the hour requirements are now. Um, but if you would like to join Local 706 as a hairstylist or a barber, you have to have a cosmetology license. That's super helpful. And so hang on, Alex. So Prashana, when you were starting out, um, how did you learn what you needed to know? Did you have friends? Did you find a mentor? Did you find a job? Like, how did you find uh, how to learn what you needed to learn? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I had um, my best friend, actually, that I met in cosmetology school, her aunt was a professional makeup artist in local 706 okay. and she took both of us under her wing and she mentored both of us on how to get the hours that we needed to actually join local 706 because on top of having your cosmetology license you have to also have certain requirements to get into local 706 so you either have to have 30 union days, which if you're not union, you have to have a special skills waiver. And a special skills waiver can consist of you having a personal relationship with an actor on a show or a movie film show film, or you have a special skills that's not already someone union has. And you do those 30 days as your special skills. So it could be barbering um it could be textured hair it could be a certain wig extraordinary person, <laughs> person um or the traditional route which is um 60 60 60 which is 60 non-union but it has to be paid through a payroll company for three consecutive years so you have to get 60 of those days for three consecutive years. <laughs> and um, that's the harder way to get into the union, but it's also, it's also doable. You just have to keep track of all of your hours. You have to keep track of your call sheets. You have to keep track of your 
um, paycheck stubs when you're paid through those payroll companies. And um, you just have to be really diligent with the 60, 60, 60, because those days also, after that third consecutive year, they start to drop off. Yeah, that's super helpful. Alex? You're muted. You're muted, love. Oh. No! Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, if I may, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, three years in a period of five years. So okay. what, yeah. So what, like the way that I did it was I did the 60, 60, 60, which I highly recommend, uh, because it cuts your teeth. And for those of you that are younger and don't know that phrase, uh, it shows the, the people that are in the union that you've done your dues, you've paid your time, uh, you've taken the 180 days of, 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 uh, awful shows and bad situations and amazing situations. You've gone through it all. So you're experienced, you're grizzled and they will, they will look at you and say, okay, this kid's been through the ringer, you know, okay. They know, you know, they, they obviously they want to be in here. So, you know, they'll welcome you in a lot better. Uh, the special skills, absolutely. Same thing. Uh, what I was going to say about that earlier when I raised my hand was, as you know, barbers are in huge demand. I demand. Huge I, demand. So, yeah. And I think want, it's if, a really good note, Alex, because then we're going to talk a little bit. We, we just posted a uh, production beast has a great article that breaks down the different departments and the different jobs in those departments. And we're going to talk about what those first touch jobs can be in the different departments that our guests run. And I think anything, I think the other phrase that people should look out for is groomer, right? Barbers and groomers. As long as you're not in England. Yeah. Okay. Men's grooming. And so, um, and I think if you guys can talk about that is um, sometimes men's hair. Sometimes they talk about, uh, is that a phrase that they use for, for men as opposed to women in beauty? Like if somebody's looking to set themselves apart and find an opener lane, getting trained and also specializing in how to get trained as a groomer or a barber is what you're saying are, are really great opportunities for entry right now. Yes. I mean, it, you'll, you'll it, always work. Hmm. Poor Shauna. You will. He's right. You will always work. Um, I'm actually right now searching for a barber for our next season of our show. <laughs> What show are you on? All American. Oh, okay. Alex has some good ones. So he might have some referrals for you. Oh, please. He's hooked me up with some very good rumors. So, so Eva, when people are, uh, what's different? Do you have to have different training, different skill set? Can you give people some insight to what's different about what you learn about grooming than you would about other hair and makeup kind of training? Um, you know, it's so interesting. Well, if I could backtrack a little bit, um, it took me 11 years to get into yeah. 706. Yeah. It's not, and some people get into 706 on their first job. Oh. Like, it's wild. There kind of is no rhyme or reason. Um, I would absolutely suggest to young people who are kind of a little afraid of getting into the film industry and they're interested in being a makeup artist um maybe not necessarily going towards special effects but like beauty is get a job at a counter because you're going to have all kinds of people come visit you and they're going to need their foundation matched mm -hmm. they're going to want do you mean like in the department store when you walk in and they have all the different cosmetics companies I do. Okay. I do mean that. I mean, at a makeup counter where you are exposed to all kinds of different products and you're exposed to all kinds of different faces and you're going to have to make those faces look beautiful. Um, the same, I would, I, it, it's boots on the ground. It's hands on experience. It's practice that you're getting paid for and you don't have to worry about it going in front of a camera. Um, from there, um, you know, getting non-union work is, is uh, usually how people kind of get into it. And it's, uh, it's, again, it's just training. It's training to get, to get your skills up to the level that's going to be acceptable to work on larger 
union shows once you get in the union. Yeah. Um, so we're going to post a couple of places that I know a lot of us go to to list as you start to build your credits. This is a place you want to set up a profile. This is where we're going to find you a lot of times. Um, and this is where you can search for jobs that are coming up that are union and non-union um, and, and start to also find the shows that you love, that you love the look of, that speak to your heart. Um, and look on IMDB and start to read about who's doing those shows. Finding the right mentor, the right inspiring people can really help you use the tools of social media and access that we kind of have to each other in, in this way now um, to really target where do you want to work and who do you want to work with and who do you want to learn from. And so there are some amazing sites that we're going to post that I would start looking at how people are posting and how they talk to themselves and the kind of credits that they're learning. And these should be some of your first stops. Um, absolutely. I would also say that you need to absolutely not see other makeup artists and other hairstylists as your competition right. because that you're going to get your work through. That's who's going to recommend you for the next job they can't do, but they met you and understand you and think you're going to be the right personality fit. You're going to get the phone call. These are all, this is all networking. This is how we network. And we all have, we're all on the same team. We're all here to do our job, to create characters, to be a support for our actors and directors and producers and uh and each other we all have to support each other of the department not in competition the very word is mouth department yeah support. no question i mean and we we all know that many times we're like a director or producer i'm going to go to my head stylist i'm going to decide who my head stylist is and once we've collaborated on what the need is you all really have a I rely on you to build the team of who the right people are that have the right skill set to bring these characters to life. And also that I'm going to enjoy spending 12 hours a day with. I think, you know, Alex and I have been through a lot of crazy stuff. Eve and I have as well. Um, and we move fast and there's not a lot of resources. But one of the things I know they both do is also bring people they know Kimberly's going to fall in love with, that they're, she's going to love having on set that's going to be part of the team and people bounce from show to shows and they take each other with them and poor shauna how you build a hair team with people have to be really good at what they do super flexible patient can you tell us more about the characteristics when you're building a team of when you're finding the people you you want to bring on set with you um what you're looking looking for in personality what you're looking for in addition to talent in their portfolio it also i look for um first i look at my cast and i know who my cast is and i think about who would gel well with the cast because they are we, we spend so much intimate time with these actor and actresses and sometimes they do like Eva said earlier, they share very personal information. So I have to think about who am I going to bring on the team that number one is not going to be live during a hair session, who's not going to be posting or who, who won't go to TMZ um, <laughs> and share this personal information that sometimes we are privy to in the trailer. Um, I think about of course, skills, but it boils down to personality because we spend so much time. I'm like, who who do I want to be in the trailer with all the time? Like, who can the producers communicate with if I'm unavailable and I'm with an actor? Are they able to step up for me at that moment and communicate what's needed for our department? Um, also, who's going to be reliable? Like, that is huge right now. Are you going to show- What does reliability mean to you? Does it mean being on time or 
what additional qualities de define being reliable to you? If, if this job is for 10 months, are you actually going to be with me for this, these full 10 months? Or is something bigger, better, and cooler coming down the line and you say, hey, next week's my last week, I'm going on to this. Like, are you actually committed to these 10 months? And are you, if you need to be out, are you gonna actually replace yourself? Which or be good. Right. With the same skill set, same personality, or are you gonna say, Oh, I'm so sorry, I don't feel good, I'm not coming in for a week, and then you leave that responsibility to me to find someone as your replacement for the week. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. I hope that um everybody in the audience uh understands that in 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 your talent and as you grow your talent and the more hours that you get developing your skills that you realize it's just as important as that who you are and mm -hmm. um, and your own set of personality and charisma uh, is just as important. I would prefer to have somebody that has less experience or even a less broad, like Alex is somebody I know no matter, and even, no matter what we're doing, I know they can do it. They can do big monsters, they can do blood. A lot of people specialize. I do beauty, I do, um, you know, monsters. But these two are, they can do anything. And so I would rather have, I can, I feel like they can teach somebody how to get better skill set and more experience, but you can't teach somebody how to be a good team member. And I'd rather have somebody, yes, Eva. It, to that point, I will say, um, building on Farshana's uh, reliability, um, punctuality mm. is number one. Like the, yeah. The call sheet, Especially for your department. Absolutely. Our day of shooting starts in our trailer. You must, I cannot stress enough how important it is to be on time. It sounds like such a simple thing, but you'd be surprised at how hard it is for some people to show up on time. I would also say, um, and this has come into light a lot, especially because of the last couple of years of COVID, et cetera. Um, that it's really important to take care of your own body. It's important to take care of yourself. Um, you have to be, you know, uh, in order to, to show up, to be present, to be able to take direction, like being hungover and partying too much. I really don't care. What, I really don't care what you do on the weekends, but you still have to be a responsible adult and be a healthy person, like, please don't moonlight and work all night the night before and then come to work having not slept because I know that you're not going to be able to function if I'm department heading and you're my assistant and I know that you haven't slept the night before because you needed to take this extra job. I know that I can't rely on you to be present and to be healthy and to be here. Um, it's just, it's so important to take care of your body. Yeah. Um, even, even like structurally, like getting, uh, uh, take, eating, oh, eating, sure. eating good foods and getting exercise and getting enough sleep is so, so, so important for being a productive member of the trailer is what I'm really trying to important. say. And, and nobody have, really yeah. talks about that. Yeah, and I think um, it's a conscientiousness, right? If you're mm -hmm. a smoker, you have to be conscientious about the, how you smell because that actor needs to be around you for hours at a time. You don't want it. And there's, so, there's a thoughtfulness that I'm looking for when, when we are crewing up about somebody who's going to think about, I don't want to wear this really heavy perfume because I don't want to impose that upon my actors. I need to be neutral so they can be in the space they need to be. Um, so all of you, I, I think what's really important is people realizing there's all kind of different ways you can structure your career. Um, everybody here is from, uh, Alex is in Saudi Arabia on set right now. Eva is in New Orleans working on a film. Portana is on the road all the time. But I think when you do television shows, there are people who maybe work in commercials or with a studio. 
there are ways that you, if you want to have a more, uh, you don't want to travel a lot, you're raising, uh, want to have kids in school, want to be more steady. There are also really great sections of this, um, of this job where you can build the life you want to have and the quality of life you want to have. So I would love for you guys to talk about the different seasons of your career where traveling makes sense. Um, uh, Eva, your husband's also a very accomplished um, professional in the camera department and you guys have a lifestyle where you're not together all the time and how do you navigate that? Portia, how do you decide if you're, you could go on tour and be gone for a year and how does that impact you and your lifestyle? And, um, and now you're on one of the biggest TV shows CW's ever had. And what's that like to kind of be more of a, a 10 to 10 kind of day and being one location, you know, being one place for months at a time. So Portia, okay. why don't you start talking about that? So I have actually, I have a 13 year old daughter. So for me, being on the road all the time, I would have to strategically plan it. So I would only take, I would say like on location jobs during the summer where she could come with me. Um, and then my mom would travel with me. So that way I'm not missing her, but I'm also able to take this next gig. But being on this show, I'm able to see her a lot more. And on the, in the summer months, that's when we're on hiatus. Hiatus is when we're not filming. Um, we're able to just travel together personally. And the difference is I get to be at home in my own bed versus when you're on the road, you're in different hotel rooms, um, you're in different beds, different sheets, different pillows. <laughs> you um, have to have, you have, you're constantly going to the store because you're constantly running out of things and you don't have home cooked meals when you're on the road. It's not as glamorous as people think people see it and they're like, we want to travel. We want to be a celebrity hairstylist on the road all the time. You miss your friends. You miss your family. You miss milestones if you have children when you're constantly on the road versus being at home and doing a TV show or a film. You get to see your family at night when you come home or in the morning and on the weekends, you get to spend time with your friends and it's easier being at home than being on the road, but some people enjoy being on the road. I'm not. <laughs> That's super helpful. And, but I love this insight because I, I want our audience to really see that you can craft um, and go through different parts of your career mm -hmm. um, where there's just such a wide range of opportunity here. And when you start in one type of um, show, or a lifestyle, mm -hmm. you can grow and change uh, as you grow your skill set, and it can evolve. Alex, you're in Saudi Arabia right now, <laughs> working on a show that has, a, and we're going to talk about special effects makeup, and hopefully in the fall, we're going to do a session that's just about special effects makeup, because we could talk about it with, um, with the hair and makeup that goes into some of your favorite monsters, even the shows like Peacemaker. Um, that all the kind of insane things and the Harry Potters of the world and the marvel of it all. Um, hair and makeup is such a critical component of, and then there's all the cosplay that goes with it and how many hair and makeup people I know that work in the convention world um, and the live event world. And now we're getting into AR and VR and hair and makeup styling for the metaverse. Um, our new avenues in games and mocap that we are moving into that creating even new opportunities for hair and makeup people. Um, Alex, talk a little bit about, uh, gosh, you're in Saudi Arabia and the things that you have to think about when you're traveling, like there's ways to access resources and materials. Or not. Be resourceful or not. And, um, and so why do you, you, um, you choose to travel and be on these amazing shows and see the world? Talk about what goes into those choices of what you decide to work on. Well, here's the thing that I'll tell you. It's the most, being in Saudi Arabia has been one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Um, because, uh, hang on one second, just saying goodnight to the team. 
because it's 10.03 p.m. here. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, and this goes back to the whole thing of like, you know, seeing actors for who, who they are behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, being my mother's Jewish, uh, so coming over to Saudi Arabia was a little bit, uh, shall we say, tense. And because, you know, for 40 years, I've been watching TV and film based in America. And, you know, so my perception of what Saudi Arabia was, was based on film and television and media and stuff like that. So coming over here um, has been the most eye-opening and heartwarming experience because it is, okay, the drivers are crazy. Yes. There's a lot of <laughs> ego. Yes. But the people are so warm and welcoming and, you know, there, there's, there's no animosity towards me or anybody else. It's yeah. like, so it's being able to get that kind of enlightenment and how is yeah. that impacting your work and, and choosing jobs that take you to places where you get to have these experiences. Well, that was, that was exactly what led me to get this job or actually I started out on a movie called desert warrior and I called up, you know, a bunch of people that were, you know, might be interested and, I'm like, hey, it's in Saudi. And they're like, nope. Well, it, nope, nope, nope. Right. And so finally, you know, well, not finally. I mean, it was like the third person on my, on my call list or second person. But I was waiting for him to return my call. He was like, Saudi? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Because to me, it's about the adventure. It's about the experience of having something that nobody else has had. Like, I, I'm not kidding you. Last night, members of the Saudi military cooked us camel. And we had dinner with them. Right. And we ate on the floor with our hands, eating rice and all that. I mean, it was like, yeah. You know, and you carry that, those experiences with you that mm -hmm. inform the different shows you can now do as yep. well. You're and also, in a really organic way. And also because there are a lot of Middle Eastern actors in the U.S. that are being cast for parts, you know, whatever they are. And it allows you to communicate and, and kind of like open up a bit more because it just, it gives you a frame of reference, a, a, a common ground, you know? Mm -hmm. And so- That's a really know, great was, way to express that and have people kind of think about what kind of life do you want to have? And will this career facilitate not just your skill set, but what your life can be? And I think it's really important that we share that with our up and coming aspiring talent. Eva, I want to talk a little, thank you for sharing that, Alex. It's a really different way of thinking about it's more than just building your portfolio, right? Yeah. Um, so as we kind of round the corner here, we have our last couple of questions. I want to talk about um, what people should think about. We want to demystify what it takes to get a job, right? Film and TV just seems so elusive. So when you are putting together, when you're looking to hire people, we, we all work together for a long time. And once you get people you trust, People can kind of um, work together in a wolf pack. So chances are, if I hire one of these three, I have a good, I have a good uh, prediction of a lot of the people who are going to be on that team because I know who they trust and who they bring with them. So sometimes it can feel even more daunting to try sure. to get in. Um, so when that rare opportunity happens, when you can bring in somebody new, what are the names of the jobs that are entry level in your department? right are they pa do you hire pa production assistants for your department um what are what do people how do people get in before they can start to level up and when you are looking at somebody new that you don't know are you looking at a list of credits what if somebody doesn't have a lot are you if you, somebody has a lot of credits do you want to see a portfolio what does that need to have in it can you guys and then start with eva start to tell us some tips about how can I present myself and what do you want to hear from me that can convince you to take a shot on me? Um, well, it's so interesting because I came up in this industry pre-social media. It was, it was, we were all like trying to figure out how to sink money into our own <clears throat> and like building a reel and actually getting photos printed out for a portfolio. It's so different now. Um, I would, if I'm looking at someone new, 
that I need to hire because I need extra hands on set. Um, I am looking at their social media, how much, um, sometimes there's too much, too much social media. Um, you gotta be, you gotta keep, you gotta keep it tight. You gotta be careful about, um, oh man, it's so hard because Instagram has made makeup like a whole new thing now. And Instagram makeup is very different from being on set. And I understand young people seeing what's happening on Instagram going, I wanna be a part of that. I wanna do that, looks great. That's a totally different situation than being at, in a trailer working with actors on a set. Um, but getting back to your original question, Kimberly, it's um, it, it, self, um, I need, I need, well, like to my original point, you need to show up, you need to be on time. You need to be dressed professionally. You need to be alert and uh, watchful and helpful. Um, and uh, keep your nose out of your phone, for heaven's sake, pay attention. Kind of the best advice I ever got were two words, pay attention. If you pay attention, to what your first AD is saying, if you pay attention to what's on the call sheet, if you pay attention to what your boss is telling you, if you pay attention to the nonverbal cues that your actor is giving you, 99% of your job is being given to you already. Mm. Um, <clears throat> you have to pay attention. Uh, and if you have questions, that's great. Uh, then ask them, ask away. Like knowledge is power. If you have any questions about anything that's happening, go to your direct, go to your direct uh, supervisor, go to your key, go to your whoever's running background, what, whatever capacity. Um, be curious, um, but also like, kind of get your nose out of your, get your nose out of your phone. That's like, I can't stress that enough. It's shocking that we have to say it, but we say it yeah. because... Oh. And it's, re and it's reflexive. People just do it. I mean, I do it when I'm watching TV. Like, I'm supposed to be watching a TV show, but I'm like, mur, mur, yeah. mur, mur. 20 minutes later, I'm like, wait, I missed. What am I doing? Yeah. It's so instinctual at this point. It's, um, it's, it's hard to remember to do that, but like, you've got to be there. And yeah. uh, I think these are great for tips for people who, you know, we're sharing information about how to be on set. But even when you're first meeting us and you're having your Zoom interview and you are having mm -hmm. your first contact with us, we're paying attention to all these things that you're doing you don't realize you're doing. Prashana? I just want to go back to what she said about too much social media when I'm looking for talent. Yeah. For me, if I'm looking through your Instagram and I can basically tell you your life story, that's too much info that you're sharing on social media. And that tells me you might be one of the individuals in my trailer, recording an actor, trying to get photos with an actor, trying to be an actor's friend. And for me, that's a big no-no. So if I'm looking at your social media, I shouldn't be able to tell you what you did three weeks ago because it's a whole 30 minute video of you being on set. Like that's yeah. a huge no-no, yeah. I think people need to think about um, when they start to work and want to work professionally to separate out your personal and keep it personal. And then Good. having a separate Instagram that respects and reflects who you are as an artist and who you are as an up and coming professional. And I don't think young people think enough that we're paying attention to that because that fits on their social from high school they're not thinking we're taking that into consideration. But I love Porshana that, you know, one of the most important things is discretion. Yes. And many of the shows that we work on have, nobody wants to Mandalorian to leak. So part of it is also the shows we're working on require significant privacy rules. In addition to just protecting your artist and your fellow crew, um, I know of 
people who work on certain TV shows who just answered like a fan's question on um, Twitter and ended up losing their position because they didn't realize it was something that was private and not their place to speak to that the publicity department from the television network didn't appreciate. Someone who's randomly from the crew innocently answering a question, but we're looking for new people who have that sense in their head. Um, so it's important that you really look at all the facets of your life and how you're presenting goes into how we decide to hire people. Alex, what are the top characteristics of somebody that you're going to hire and their personality in addition to their port? Do, what do you want to see in their portfolio, especially because you work in special effects? Are you open to hiring somebody that needs to learn on the job? Oh, or absolutely. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit but more about that? Absolutely. But one of the things real quick to go back to, uh, to back, back to what uh, Portiano was saying and Eva, uh, we actually had somebody post a video of a practice stunt. And luckily they had already gone home for the Ramadan break and they were told not to come back. And so, so explain that that was, that was breaching the confidentiality and the privacy yep. of the show. Yep. So it's and important. the thing is, is they have but what are called. We're going to be, ending soon so i'd love to just get some of your okay. insight on how you're hiring right. and if somebody's listening who wants to get a job with you what do you want them to come prepared you know so let's so get that so here's the thing here's the thing about portfolios portfolios don't tell you how much time it took to do the makeup <laughs> they, just show yeah. you, they, they just show you the finished product um and going back to the whole social media thing and also portfolios 17 shots of a crappy makeup does not make it look better. One shot of a mediocre makeup is better than 17 shots of a bad makeup. Because the thing is, is and this is the way that I yeah, look at it. Some people post because they feel like they should have a lot of stuff. That's really But a lot of the it. same thing is is boring. You know, okay. I mean, it's just, it's boring. Um, you know, don't repeat images. You know, I mean, I know there's a couple images on my, on my website of the glow makeup uh, that are repeat but they're not repeats because they're different angles so it becomes a different a different look when you look at it from the different angle one is from this side and the whole pattern's different, one different is from this side. with purpose don't just exactly. have multiples to fill exactly so a black eye from here and a black eye from there you know the same black eye like here mm -hmm. here here that's useless um recommendations are a big thing for me um go. you know i in saudi i i needed another person to come into the shop and, you know, there are no makeup artists in Saudi that are other than, you know, the Instagram people, uh, I use an, another term. Um, and because, you know, like you were saying, they're not makeup artists, you know, they, they, they paint their own faces. That's, I mean, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's, it's, and it's it incredible. doesn't translate to what we need on set. Exactly. exactly. So you're looking for people who have what? Give us more of a, what do you so, want to see? What I like is people with a reputation. Uh, whether it's a new reputation or an old reputation, as long as there's a reputation. Uh, as an example, David, who's now with us on Rise of the Witches as well, uh, he his IMDb is almost non-existent, but his resume has him listed as working for six years on Game of Thrones, on you know a number of other projects. So Dungeons and Dragons most recently. So what I did was I contacted the co-department head of Dungeons and Dragons, who I know, and I said, hey, listen, David, you know, is interested in coming and working with us. What do you know about him? What can you tell me about him? And she's like, oh, you know, great worker, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, all right, cool. So, you know, do that you think you're trusted of to you. do this? Yeah. And well, also because I know the person. I know the person very well. And so, you know, it's, it's the reputation that precedes you and the reputation that you're going to leave is the most important thing for me because if somebody doesn't do it the way I want it to be done as long as it looks right I'm happy and like one of the one of the most one of the most important qualities for me is if somebody doesn't know how to do something they're going to say how do you want me to do it you know because and that's one of the things I always tell people if you're unsure and you don't want to look like an idiot even though you're not because you're asking a question Ask the person in charge, how would you like me to do this? Yes. I mean, I did that, I did that on, uh, on Star Trek Beyond when I was running silicone for Joel and Steve, uh, because Steve, I know how to run silicone the way I do it, but I didn't know how to run it the way they did it. So I just said, Steve, 
show me how you want me to run the silicon so I make sure I do it your way every single time. And he was like, you got it, no problem. Those are and great that's... tips, Alex. The way that you expressed that was just so on the money. I really appreciated it. Um, yeah. I want to pivot to, in our last time here, we're going to talk about the show Face Off. <laughs> and then yeah. we're going to talk about um, training. Do you, as so I want you all to think about, do you have places that, like, where did you train specifically? Do you know a lot of people are all over the country that are tuning into this? Are there places you recommend? Are there places that are stay away from that you can think about? Um, so I want to talk about any recommendations or advice you have as somebody's deciding, we have a bunch of high schoolers, how am I going to decide, um, where's the right place for me to train and learn? Is there a difference? Are there phrases I should look for? If I go to a website, what are the phrases I should look for to know that this training program is going to be worth my investment and get me where I want to go? So who wants to go first with that? Anybody got some thoughts or advice or leads? Yeah, Eva and then Alice. Uh, really quick. Um, I watched only a few episodes of Face Off and was immediately like, I can't. Because there are so many skills that those artists are demonstrating you don't need to know how to build, how to sculpt a prosthetic, how to, how to do a, 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 a cowl. cast. You don't know how to do teeth. You don't need to know how to run silicone in order to be an excellent makeup artist. So I feel like that show, it intimidated me and I was a professional in the industry. I was like, I can't compete with these people you don't have to know how to do all the things in order to do a good job at your job. And have a sense. really vibrant career. That's exactly right. That's great. And it's like, don't it's, need it's all the time. Yep. They can't work on a special effects show. Because right. they like, don't, oh, I saw a face off and I don't know how to do this. Uh, yeah. I'm scared. Now I'm scared. Now I can't do it. Now I'll never measure up. Now I'll, it preyed on all of my insecurities. I was like, I don't know how to build a mold. There are people that that's all they do and they're excellent at their jobs. And in so, the other hand, if there's one thing you're really great at, I think um, I, the wake people and people who are really oh, good at kind of yeah. work every day, all day, as much as yes. they want. If there's yes. something that you know and really specialize, I remember paying crazy amounts of money for a tattoo artist. To, 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 and, and this person just yeah. did specific historic tattoos in yeah. something that could come off because that actor was working in another show. And so somebody can come in and know how to do henna and temporary and work all the time because they're that's what they did in their real life. And that translated to the film and television. Right. As, uh, as, far after, as, as far as like training and schooling and stuff, I mean, I've been... Uh, the school that I went to is no longer open, but I, I know that there are some, I mean, is I, I think getting apprenticeships, I think if you're interested in working in a lab or a shop, like there are so many smaller shops now instead of just the big guys, yeah. in town, like ADI or k &B or Spectral or whatever. Um, there are such, there are smaller places that you can go and get apprenticeships and learn um you know uh it's it's harder to find work for on the job training on union shows um and i don't know what there is as far as makeup schools but i know that there's really good ones out there um, and you don't have to go to Tokyo or London or Toronto or whatever. wherever you live. They're really, wherever, like they're like, go to school, just go to a school, go to a school and, and learn your sanitation, learn please. how to keep, le please, like <laughs> learn, how to, now. Mm -hmm, learn how to keep your tools sanitized and clean so that no matter what actor comes into your chair, you're keeping them and yourself safe. 
Um, Alan? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, Legends Makeup Academy, that's what it is. Okay. Um, so, Do you recommend Legends or you don't recommend oh, Legends? Absolutely, no, 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 absolutely recommend it. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because here's one of the tip, here's one of the tips that I have to offer regarding, uh, regarding schooling. Look at who the teachers are. If it's the same teachers over and over and over and over and over again, that means they're not working makeup artists. Correct. If they're rotating in and out, like when I, cause I used to work for, I, um, I used to work for Elegance, which, uh, Eva, was that the one that you went to? No, I went to Westmore. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I worked for Elegance for a little bit and also uh, Cinema Makeup School when Lee Joyner was there. And the things that I told them was, I am a makeup artist who will teach. I am not a teacher who does makeup. And so I told them, I said, if I get a job, I'm out. I mean, I didn't say it like, you know, like I'm out. But, you know, I was like, I need to, I need you guys to know that if I have a job, especially union, I'm, I'm going to take it. And as long as you guys are okay with that, I'm happy to fill in. I'm happy to sub, happy to do whatever course you want me to do. But that's the way it has to be because I'm not going to be a teacher. I'll be a makeup artist who teaches. And excuse me. So anyway, so Lee, when they separated from cinema, started Legends Academy. And he has teachers like Joel Harlow, uh, um, uh, V. Neal. I mean, you know, some of the top in the business are, are teaching at that school. That's and, great. you know, it, it's not like they're not well. I mean, V has retired. But, yeah. you know, V is one of those people that, like, if you get to learn from her. <laughs> That's right. I would hire you on my crew if your thing yeah. said I studied with V. I'll yeah. give you a exactly. shot. Yeah. Exactly. That's really helpful. And, so legends and, and everybody, um, we're going to have a whole resource guide that the library puts together. <laughs> That's going to include resources that actually are in the library, both digital and um, and books, and resources and LinkedIn learning. All of the links that you're getting from our um, guests here today, and you're going to be getting that. Everybody who registered for the class will get that email PDF with other resources we're going to add in. So also, if you all think of stuff after we record this, please email it to me, and we'll add it to the resource document that we're going to email to all of our guests. Uh, Portia, Portiana, sorry. I just want to add in for hair as far as training goes. Um, no cosmetology school is going to teach you what you need to have a successful career. No matter what they say in their description, it's not going to teach you what you need to know in the real world. It's only going to teach you what you need to know for cosmetology state board. Um, I know the huge cosmetology schools like Paul Mitchell and Nevada, if that is your career path to work in one of those salons or be like a platform hairstyl hairstylist, then go to that school. Because then that school is gonna teach you what you need to know, those product wise, those cutting techniques, um, those coloring techniques. But if you your ultimate goal is to really be in film and TV, you need to know all types of hair, um, from the straightest of hair to the coiliest, kinkiest of hair. You, there's several different programs out there, um, and some programs are geared towards film and TV, but read the course description. The course description is really going to tell you exactly what you're going to learn, and if half of the description is just moderators talking or someone talking about their resume, and you're paying a thousand dollars, it's doing you a disservice. Um, make sure those courses that you are going to take actually teach you. You actually have hands on training. And for me, I went to a beta because I didn't know how to round brush. I already know how to do kinky, coily textures. So I stepped outside of the box and went to a school that was going to teach me a different hair texture that I had no idea about. And now like it's actually helped me because I can go from a show like Criminal Minds to All American and jump back and forth because I can do any texture that sits in my chair. Um, so it's really important if you wanna be a hairstylist to know and get into those programs where you can touch every single type of texture. It's very important. 
That's so helpful. And, and, um, and we're going to end on, you know, mentorship and apprenticeship and finding you have power in, in, in how you can learn and start to educate yourself to get ready for opportunity. And so we, we've heard the word mentorship and apprenticeship. So can you give one tip or insight as to, as people are choosing who to learn from, what should they look for? What should they ask for? Um, from an apprenticeship in hair and makeup. Alex? Uh, am, am I, okay, I'm not muted. Uh, so real quick, this is, and, and this, this goes into what you're saying. Um, this is how I got my job on Desperate Housewives. I was doing a movie with Eva Longoria. I was doing her makeup on the show, right? And she asked me at one point, she said, have you ever thought about coming on Desperate Housewives? And I said, I would love to, but I don't think they would touch me. And she goes, why not? I said, because nobody knows I do beauty makeup. And she goes, well, you've been doing because my makeup. Because you have been doing special effects and monster right. makeup for so yeah. long. Yeah. And she goes, well, you've been doing my makeup. So I think I'm a pretty good reference. And, you know, which I was just like, oh, my God, thank you so much. And I told her, I said, but, but with all due respect, I don't want to take somebody's spot. I don't, want to, I don't want to ripple the waters. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. All I would like is an opportunity to prove myself. That's it. And she was like, done. Four months later, I got the phone call. The point of this is, is don't offer to clean people's brushes. Don't offer to sweep floors. Ask them to give you an opportunity to prove yourself. Task me with something. Let me do it for you. And then judge me based on my abilities. Because if, you know, if I want somebody to clean my brushes, A, I clean my own brushes. B, uh, a makeup artist doesn't clean other makeup artists' brushes. Like, that's not their job. I mean, they'll do it as a favor. You know, and don't like, let hey, anybody tell tonight. you that that is the, if that's all you're getting is opportunity to clean up and sweep hair and run things back and forth to the um, rental houses, that's not an apprenticeship or an internship. No. It's no. a I mean, you can be a you can be a PA for the makeup department, like on Orville. Uh, uh, a very dear friend of mine, Kwame, was was the makeup department PA, and so he was doing running back and forth between the units, you know, uh, organizing materials, supplies, all that kind of stuff. Um, but he was non-union, you know, so he couldn't do the makeup. He couldn't touch but, the makeup. Correct, but he still played an integral role. Yeah. In the show, because you know he was able to do that. Eva, any tips or thoughts about what to ask for and what to look for when creating your learning environment? Well, and, oh, I'm sorry. I, you, you yeah, blocked, when you're looking for you internship it. or apprenticeship, do you have any tips or insight for what people should look for and who or what they're, they need to learn? Uh, you know, I think just to... Just a curiosity, uh, an interest in learning, uh, an interest in knowing how how it all works, how all of filmmaking works, um, not just what happens in the trailer, but what happened, like what the camera's looking at and what everybody else is doing, because you are a part of a much larger machine mm -hmm. working on film and television. And so really understanding what everybody else's job is is also kind of part of it. Yeah. Um, just open heart, open mind um, is and uh, goes a long way. I That's love what it. I would say. I love it. And along with that, I love people who ask questions. I don't need um, a young crew person who wants to make me feel like they already know everything. I know you don't. Yeah. You know why? Because I don't know anything and I've been making films for 30 years and I learn on every show. So if I have a crew person or a young apprentice who isn't asking questions and isn't sharing, I want to do special effects makeup. I want to do beauty. I want to specialize in green screen and blue screen and special in uh, you know VFX hair and makeup. I know that's not a person I, I wanted to invest in training and teaching. Um, Porshana. I would say if you are looking for an apprenticeship uh, program that you actually know who you want to apprentice. Um, because if you're going to be spending so much time with this person learning from them, 
you have to make sure it aligns with your career goals. Like if you want to be a special effects makeup artist, make sure the person you're apprenticing is actually a special effects makeup artist. Um, and decent. Yes. Decent person, that's right. Yeah, and like Alex said, make sure they are a current working artist because I can sit here and say, oh, I've been a hairstylist for 30 years, but I haven't stepped foot on a set in 20. So I have no idea what the current requirements are. I have no idea what the trends are currently. So make sure the person that you are apprenticing is actually aligning with what your career goals are. I love that. And I think that's such a powerful statement um, to wrap this up. I want to thank all of you. Please hear all the virtual applause going on with our audience. It means the world to me that you came and shared such specific and helpful and uplifting information for all, all of our artists. And um, please find their shows, please find their websites um, and support the work that all of these artists are doing because they're creating opportunity for so many people. Again, this wraps up this semester for our program. So we want you guys to have a great summer. Um, Lida, thanks so much. Thank you and thank you all for coming today. This really was a very insightful program and what a great way to end the series for the summer. Um, we hope you all enjoyed the program. Big thank you to you, Kimberly, Eva, Alex, and Porshana. You shared such valuable information today and with amazing insight. And we're grateful you, you were all able to come today. You can visit our website at lacountylibrary.org slash creative careers. I'll put that in the chat and you can review past recordings there, plus the resources for uh, both of the past series. So there's that link. Um, with that, I guess we can um, part ways. This was a wonderful program and I look forward to uh, working with you all again. Happy Thanks, summer. Bye. 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 Bye.